So, North Alaska is probably one of uh, the places that's experiencing the most loss and the most rapid loss, I would say, at the moment. It will not continue to be so because we'll have lost everything um, and some other place will get to step into that role. So I'm going to do a quick review of just sites in the Barrow area. So this is a tiny little piece of North Alaska. Um, you can see the state down there and this little box is, is where they are. So anyway, starting with Nuvo. This is a site which has some serious uh, problems. Um, it has permafrost at the level where this thing sticks out and above that it's actually unconsolidated gravel unlike most of the sites. This is a picture taken in 1976 from a Raycon tower. Um, here is a picture taken from the same tower in 1996 by actually the same photographer. Um, that's my brother walking around the last house. Um, here is another view turned the other way from that tower looking toward what they call Plover Point. So this is basically a view east. You can see a house in the middle of all this. Um, here is 1996 with the shadow of the tower. Um, this tower fell in 1997. You can see how far the coastline is away from uh, the foot of this tower. In 1997, we had a storm that took out this tower. Um, so um, this picture looks like it's taken from the same place, but in fact, I took it from a helicopter. Um, so you can see major devegetation. We worked at Nuvuk uh, because it was a cemetery. Um, people started, started seeing uh, human remains eroding in 1997. We actually got, realized that it was a cemetery, not just a couple of isolated burials in about 2001 and started working there and worked there through 2010, 2011. So here's basically every, every color is a different year. So we have different coastlines. This is, this is the space between in, in one decade. It's about 60 meters, a little bit more. Uh, that's a lot in a decade. Um, we did most of the work there using local students as a crew. There was a really cool funding program that we were able to get support for because we did actually have to pay a lot of the local students. Um, they other, the kids that we wanted to uh, get involved were also the people who were going to go to college. And in the United States, that's expensive. So uh, they had to work in the summer and we had to offer a viable alternative in terms of wages um, to uh, other jobs they could have gotten. Uh, this was by far preferred if they could make the money because they really, a lot of them liked the archeology span and the rest of them liked getting to ride four wheelers every day. So <laughs> um, to and from work. So we, this project was very much to address local concerns and questions. And we also were trying to look at broader research uh, issues. So we did an awful lot of, of survey. We'd, every year we would do a pedestrian survey. This place gets a lot of vehicular traffic and things would get churned up. So every, we'd start every season this way. Um, and then we dug a lot of shovel test pits. We didn't really have the funding or the access in it, the early days. Uh, yeah, remote sensing and geophysical methods really weren't on. So we dug probably 40,000 shovel test pits in unconsolidated gravel over the course of the project. Um, the person in the middle in the nice sweater is Patty Colligan, who is probably 68 or 69 in this photo. Um, she was an undergraduate, second career, and has gone on to do a PhD. <laughs> so um, anyway, we also did some excavation. Um, up at the top, that's actually a burial excavation. Um, at the bottom, that was one of the few remaining patches of intact ground, um, which was wiped out the next year. So. Um, we've actually gotten a lot from these excavations in terms of scientific knowledge. Um, you see all the little arrows are fish bones, and in fact, this is the majority of the archaeological fish bone ever recovered from the Nuvok site, right there in that picture. Um, so, and plus some nice pieces of a jet labret. Um, this is an egg. Um, these are from an Iputak house, which was catastrophically terminated by a flood. Um, this is my favorite artifact from out there. And um, we also recovered over 100 individuals from 87 separate burials, um, ranging from uh, very late Bernard, early Thule, up until we have some as late as 1600. And in fact, the community existed there until the 1940s. Um, it was actually larger than Utkiavik or Barrow until 1910, based on US Census data. And there are burials out there 
um, as late as the 20s or 30s, but those are, you know, they have grave markers and there's families. So um, we're trying to urge the families to figure out what they want to do about them um, because they're not going to last forever. This is actually a 19, uh, 18, late 1800s whaling captain's work area with a lot of Euro-American stuff. Moving on to Bernark, or Pernac, as it's actually called. This is a National Historic Landmark, so that's other World Heritage Sites. Uh, that's pretty much the import, most important thing you can be in the United States. Um, it basically has a sea level rise problem. There's actually enough of a berm you can see along the, the kind of the beach there. There's a road that goes there and they protect the road, so that protects the site most of the time. But as you can see, water is encroaching. Uh, if you look at the mound in the middle, there's some pits there. Those are actually the remnants of Wilbert Carter's unbackfilled excavations. Um, obviously, they did not build a house in water. This is not a storm surge. This is just the water. Um, you know, normal level. We do not have tides. I mean, the tides are maybe 15 centimeters normally. Um, nobody has any idea when high and low tide are. It's complete, you know, the water goes up and down depending on storms, wind, and, and hydraulic pressure. Tide is irrelevant. Um, for most of this area. So anyway, this has other problems with salt infiltration and whatnot. And actually, um, last year there was a storm surge that was large enough to breach that barrier and we got salt running all the way through the site. Um, moving on to a Cooks Utkiavik. Um, so the name of Utkiavik was originally, was recently changed back from Barrow and I haven't had time to get my guy to redo the picture, but this is basically the main community today. Um, this is a Cooksey, which is uh, the name of a ravine, but there's also this mound that used to be there. And this thing that you see with the blue tarps at the bottom used to be a mound large enough for the entire community of a couple hundred people to hold their whaling festival and blanket toss on top of, in living memory. Um, there's people who, in living memory, used to slide off the front, you know, go sledding off the front of this thing. And back in those days, there was actually a big ice foot because we got you know, big ice ridges, and they said they could slide so far off this thing that it was, when you were a little kid, you got tired walking back. Uh, not so much anymore. Uh, this has been eroding for some time. Um, here it is in 2002. This is, it, it actually, I knew it when it actually had a much more, more of a flat top. Um, and you can see how close the houses are. Um, so the second one in, the gray one, it actually used to be oriented more in a, the opposite direction and actually half of the ground underneath it has all fallen out. They had to move that house. Um, here June 1000, 2005. This is a couple years ago. You can see that there's been additional damage. Um, so they put sandbags in and then it snowed. You can see where the sandbags are in 2016. Uh, this is where they were last fall. We've just had another uh, major storm, and you can see this this uh, post there was set in the actual beach. So a huge chunk of the beach has been ripped out, and the sandbags have just kind of gone down. Um, so, you know, it's not effective protection. Um, this entire panorama, every bit of that is archaeological site underneath all those houses and, and whatnot. Every single bit of it, that's a person standing in the middle for scale. Um, it's, it's a major community. Um, here's the yellow is basically sitting on top of, uh, intact cultural strat, which is, uh, sitting on top of ice lenses. Um, and there's a lot of film in place on top of it. There actually was a road, um, that kind of was in what's now void space in this picture, at least part of it. You can see one of the piling or the sort of guardrail posts there at the edge. So they're still, they got a disaster declaration, but not much has happened so far. Um, and, and as I say, we just had a big catastrophic storm. So uh, the whole Gabion basket thing that was protecting it has now gone too. Um, so here's Wolakpa. This is kind of an iconic archeological site, which uh, most people thought was completely excavated. But in fact, if you read the report carefully, he never said that. Um, people just somehow all came to that conclusion. It was completely stable. I was thinking about work at Bernard, um because I thought that was the place that was having the most difficulties because of the sea level rise. And then in July 2013, when I think I was in Okariri, this all fell off. This whole front of this thing fell off. And then the next fall, we had a really big storm and um, things got really bad. This is not just what you just saw collapse. This is 13 meters back from what you just saw collapsed. Um, and then we lost more. 
Um, so we did a project uh, trying to address this. Um, we got, it was all almost entirely volunteer. We got people from two continents. We got all sorts of people. Most of it was supported by the landowner, who's I'm actually my employer. It's a Alaska Native Corporation, which provided both logistics and funds. We got a lot of help from local people in terms of helping bring water to the site because it doesn't have any water on site, bringing fuel, taking stuff back for refills, all that sort of things. They've done a lot of retrieval of artifacts, all kinds of useful stuff. We got almost no funding. Um, we got a little tiny travel grant from NSF. Um, excavated all kinds of really cool things, which you could, but there's a lot of challenges. The biggest one is storms. Talk about just add water. Up at the top, that is a day when we had a major storm and we spent seven and a half hours digging diversion ditches so that it would not erode the site or our camp. Um, the one down below is just a sandstorm. We have polar bears. This guy really wanted to share our bacon breakfast. Um, <laughs> And then there's funding. UIC is, has been very supportive of it, but this year we didn't get out there because UIC, the business climate in Alaska is very difficult. UIC just didn't have the spare funds to, to do it. So it couldn't happen. Um, we're lucky that mostly when we're in good financial position, we can do that. UIC is a very large multi-million dollar corporation. Most places in Alaska don't have that. Um, local residents chip in. The site is well known and it's reasonably accessible. We're only 19 miles south of town. You can get there in four wheelers. You don't have to plot, you know, you don't need planes and all kinds of stuff. But you've got increasing rates of erosion, um, partly due to the decreasing ice match, which increases fetch. Um, it's insanely warm in the north and this applies across the top of the globe. I mean, this is four to 12.3 degrees centigrade warmer than normal. Um, permafrost, we have perfect preservation nearly because of permafrost, but it's going away. Blue is good, red is bad. The top is 2009, the bottom is 2090. Not so good. So, um, basically, I, you know, I keep giving this sort of versions of this talk on this slide, but here's things that, that seem very important and I think have come out a lot in this session. Um, we need to think about these things. We need to discuss these things and we need to try to figure out ways to move forward. One of them that I think, you know, is quite important is having teams to address this. Uh, you know, the Scottish example is, is wonderful. We don't have that in Alaska. I only got people to talk about this at the state association last year. And, you know, we, most of the sites in the state, you can't get to with a rope. Um, there's parts of the state we don't have to worry about. The North Coast, 300 miles, there are probably no sites left because they're seeing erosion of up to 30 to 40 meters a year every year. So, um, you know, there's, there's some, some real challenges. Anyway, uh, that's, that's that. And those questions, I guess.